Good morning, everybody. It is good to see you guys. Would you stand with me this morning? It's my only chance to say it, but it's my wife's birthday. So have a good day.
God, we just, um, we worship you this morning. God. We just uh, pray that you would just fill this house with your spirit, God. When we go into our homes, you would fill our homes with your, just your love and, and that we would be a light to the world around us. This is a house of worship. This is a place of
of Jesus, this is a house of miracles, and we bring everything to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus, this is a house of miracles, and I still believe you're moving, I still believe you're speaking, God I my eyes on heaven God I receive your vision God I believe you working all things for good yes Lord we believe God we believe in every circumstance you are working it for your good for your glory God we love you and we worship you this morning we sing these songs of praise, not just to just to come here and do it again every week, but God, to just remind us of who you are. God, would you just allow us to continue worshiping you? Not just in song, but God, with our attitudes and with our hearts every week, God. As we step out of this building and go into our homes, would we just worship you by loving you and by loving others? God, speak to us this morning. Show us something new. Soften our hearts, open our ears for what you have for us. We pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Hey, good morning, new community. Oh, you guys can do better than that. Let's go. Good morning, new community. All right, it's so good to see everyone. If we have not met yet, my name is Kyle, and this is my beautiful wife, Amy, and we have the privilege of serving here um, at New Community. Thanks, Colton. <laughs> um, special uh, welcome to uh, those who are new today. Uh, we want to invite you to connect with us. There's multiple ways to do that, but the main one is right on the screen up behind me. Go to mync.church. Everything about the church is there. If you want to know what we're all about, how to get connected, um, different events that are going on, prayer requests. Speaking of an event, Amy, over to you. Yeah, we have volunteer appreciation dinner this Wednesday from 5.30 to 7.30. Um, Kyle and I are really excited because mainly we get a free date night uh, <laughs> because we have two kids and there's childcare, I believe. Um, there better be, because <laughs> uh, we're counting on it. Um, yeah, we're really excited. Uh, if you're interested in serving, we would love to have you there. Um, I know for Kyle and I, like community was found when we really started serving. Um, we've really enjoyed it. And when bad stuff has happened in life, most oftentimes it's the people that we're serving with knows about it and they're praying with us. So it's a great opportunity to um, get connected at that event. Yes. So we are up here to talk about why we serve. Um, two main reasons. Number one is we really consider this our family. Um, greeting people every Sunday is a great way to get to know folks in the community at church. But the second way is through a small group that we host at our house. Um, and that is a place where you can just get together with a small group of individuals uh, just to do life with and to encourage one another, to grow with one another, and to uh, learn to walk with the Lord together. So really encourage you to sign up for serving as well as get plugged into a small group. Another way that you can be involved is through giving. And so... Um, this church is such a generous church. There's different initiatives here in Maple Valley, in this church, and even across the globe. So uh, we thank you so much to those of you who give recurring. Um, if you want to just give one time today, there's ways to do that up on the screen as well. Um, but right now, I will pray for the offering. Lord Jesus, um, everything in this world belongs to you. And we are so thankful that you give us the opportunity and privilege to partner with you um, in that. Lord, um, we just pray for people's hearts this morning that are stirred to give, that they would be cheerful givers, that you would take and multiply that uh, to further your kingdom here and throughout the world. Lord, we also pray a blessing on Pastor Ken as we're starting off a series on James. Lord, just speak through him 
and uh, encourage everyone here today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So how many of you, uh, <laughs> I'll have to practice that next time. <laughs> how many of you have a favorite book that you have in your heart that, that God just kind of spoke to you? That's good to see. Six Christians are reading their Bibles. That's really nice. Okay. Uh, mine was the book of James. And when I was just, uh, uh, in fact, without the book of James, I don't know if I would be here today. It was in my early years of high school that it was just a foundational book that got a hold of me when I was just being a you know, normal high school kid, and all of a sudden, the book of James just kind of transformed my life. It started when I went to a seminar back in the late 70s and the early 80s, throughout the 80s, was written by Bruce Wilkinson. He wrote the Per Jabez. He was popularized that way. But he also is a president of Walk Through the Bible, and he taught it he taught at uh, Multnomah University in the Portland area where I grew up. And so they had this seminars. It was like a one-day seminar that you could understand the Old Testament chronologically like that. And it was phenomenal. You kind of spoke with your hands and your mouth and you kind of, you know, spoke back. And so it was an active kind of teaching seminar. And then they had walked through the New Testament. And then they tried to walk through the Bible study methods. And walk through Bible study methods basically goes like we should when we read the Bible. You observe and you interpret and, and you apply. And I just got really excited about this. And all of a sudden, my life kind of changed in, in dramatic ways when I, I brought this heater up because it, it reminds me of those days when I, before I got really growing with Jesus, I would run down my hill. We owned an acre lot. Our house is kind of on the top. So I had to run all the way down in that cold Oregon weather at times and grab the, the sports page. I mean, the newspaper. And then I got, went to the sports page and our, our house is a little musty and a little cold. And so I'd set that heater on the ground, and I'd, I'd, I'd read my paper, and, uh, and then I'd have my bowl of cereal and go off to school. And suddenly, there's that moment in which you can just remember the transformational moment. Maybe if we had show and tell, we all would bring kind of odd things to say, is this kind of represents my growth in Christ or my first time in Christ or whatever it may be, and it would be different kinds of stuff. And for me, it would be this heater and this Bible, and suddenly, instead of running down and getting that, that newspaper, I suddenly wanted to you know, turn that heater on and, and I'd get on my knees, n not because I was spiritual or anything, but I was cold, okay? And so I'd get on my knees and then I'd open up the Bible and I would go to the book of James and I did, you know, chapter titles and I began to go, what does the book of James look like in every avenue? And it, it, it transformed my life. It, it changed my life into wanting to know more about what God had to say in every avenue. And we all have that, whether we're a pastor or not, whether you're in that ministry, it doesn't really matter. It really matters is what has kind of led you or moved you to God. And if we had a small group, maybe we would say, what, what is that one icon? What is that one thing that kind of represents your, your growth in Jesus Christ? And, and James is such a powerful book. I thought, wait, I, I'm going to kind of bring that back to the good old days and, and talk about James and what it means. It's a powerful, practical book, and it gives really good advice. It's often called the Proverbs of the New Testament. And when you read the book, and I would, you know, what I would encourage you to do is read the book of James in one sitting to kind of get this big picture. It's only five chapters, 20, 25 minutes, or maybe longer if you're going to hit, listen to it. Um, but you begin to, you know, ask the, the five W's that you do in journalism, you know, the who and the what and the when, why and and where, and even sometimes how, uh, and those questions come out. 
the very first question that you tend to want to read when you read a book is, who, uh, who was the author? Who wrote the book of James? And it's a natural question is just, who was James? Because it's not rocket science when you read James chapter 1 that James wrote James, okay? <laughs> Uh, James, the servant of God and, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the deeper question in trying to figure out who this author is, is which James was it? There were four godly Jameses mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, Matthew's brother, Matthew, who wrote the first book of the New Testament, and he called it Matthew. <laughs> John, they were really creative back then, okay? And, and John. His brother was named James as well, and John wrote the fourth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the four books in the New Testament that talk about Jesus, okay? Um, Judas's father was named James, who was a godly man, and Jesus' brother, or his half-brother, because Jesus' father was God the Father himself, and um, mother was Mary, and so was James's mother, and, and all Jesus' siblings, like 10 of them or something like that. And Jesus is uh, the second oldest a child in Jesus's family was named James. Uh, when we look at Matthew and Matthew's brother, uh, there are two uh, disciples. With, uh, well, it's the son of Alphaeus. And so when you're looking at James, there's two James in, of the 12, 12 disciples, two men named James. One is John's brother, one is Matthew's. And so to differentiate that, a lot of times you'll see James, the son of Alphaeus, and Matthew's father was the same, and so many believe that those two were connected, that they were brothers. The problem with selecting this James as writing the, the epistle of James is that um, there's not much written about this um, disciple, so it is called internal evidence, not much written about him in the New Testament, and external evidence, not much written about him in his leadership at least uh, for what this author has done and, and shown to be done in the book of Acts and as, as well in the book of James. And so it's probably not Matthew's brother. The second James that we're looking at here is the um, most prominent of the four, at least in the Gospels. And he was uh, kind of connected to his brother, James and John. James is older. John was the little one, the youngest of the 12 disciples. And they were called the sons of thunder. They kind of were feisty, you know, they were fishermen, they were rugged, and they, you know, they had a little bit of a quick temper. And so Jesus kind of lovingly nicknamed them the, the sons of thunder. And James, you would think, would be a, a really good candidate for writing the book of James. Unfortunately, James was the first disciple martyred of the, of the 12. He's the first one put to death. He was stoned in Jerusalem. And the book was like, likely written after his death. So you kind of want to eliminate James, the brother of John as well. Judas's father was named James. The problem is we're not talking about Judas, you know, the betrayer. We're not talking about him. We're talking about a second Judas. Jesus, Judas, James, they were all popular names during Jesus's day. And it was like, you know, John who wrote, you know, the gospel, when he wanted to talk about Judas that wasn't Judas Iscariot, he began to nickname him, and he called him Judas, not Iscariot. Now, if you think about that, that's kind of an you know, odd nickname. If it's like, you know, if there was an axe murderer named Ken, I would be called Ken, not the axe murderer, okay? Um, the best decision probably of the four, however, is James, the brother of Jesus. And uh, this, this brother was, had a phenomenal um, life. He always followed Jesus around. And even when he didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, he would listen to the teachings of Jesus. And one time he said, if you think you're the Messiah, just go down to Jerusalem and prove it, <laughs> which he eventually did, ironically. But there was this really sweet moment in the conversion of James, understanding that his brother wasn't just a wise older brother, but that he was the son of God. When after the resurrection, Jesus dies on the cross for our sins, in the tomb for three days, and then rises again, and he sees the disciples. But before he sees the 11 disciples, he beelines it over to James, his little brother, and chats with him about who he is. But I think Jesus chatted with him a bit more, because when you look at the book of Acts and you read the book of James, this man was critical in the early days of, of, of the church growth. And I think Jesus said, I have a calling for you. 
In fact, when the Apostle Paul is a new believer, he kind of reflects that in Galatians chapter 2, and he says there are three pillars of the church. And then he goes in order. And in, in the Jewish circles, when you went in order, there's a list. The very first one was the most important. And it went James, Peter, and John. And so even Paul is saying the three pillars of the church and the most important one being James. In Acts 21, when Paul comes back on his missionary journeys, right before he goes to Rome and right before he gets in prison, right before Paul dies, he's in Jerusalem and he immediately goes to James and the other apostles, it says. And so not only did James's position stand out, as an amazing Christian leader, <laughs> we're crying out loud. He had 30 days, that he, 30 years of his life, he just followed, you know, God around. So he had pretty good leadership training, if you think about it, right? But it wasn't his position that stood out, which was a fine resume, more than his character. He was a humble man. When he wrote the book of James, he says, James, the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, the bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, even. He doesn't even say who he is. We've kind of have to figure that out through church history and through you know, inward evidence of the book of Acts and the book of James. So he doesn't say, you know, if you're going to write a bestseller, you're almost going to always say, hey, my brother was the son of God. You know, that, that sells pretty good if you think about it, right? But he doesn't. He just says, the bond servant, a servant of Jesus, like everyone else. And he was this amazing spiritual leader as well. He pulled factions together. Good spiritual leadership allows people to speak. Good spiritual leadership listens to others. And good spiritual leadership makes a decision based off what God has to say. And in Acts 13, he does all of those things. There's a faction of, of Jewish Christians, Christ followers, but still had their Jewish background. And so they, they wanted to do things and they wanted Gentiles. And Gentiles in the Bible just simply means not a Jew. Okay, so most of us in this room don't have Jewish heritage, so we're not a Jew or Gentiles, okay? And so uh, there was this argument of whether Gentile Christians, those who wanted to follow Christ in that first century church, had to do Jewish things. And it was a huge debate. And the apostle Paul was all fired up about it. And Timothy was, you know, half Jew, half Greek. And so there was, you know, that kind of mess as well. And so he, he take, Paul goes down there and beelines it. And they have this big debate. And James is the leader of it all. And he listens to these factions and he lets them speak. And then he says, in conclusion, he has a verse from God. And then he says, I, we don't want to make it difficult for Gentiles turning to God. It's a great line. We don't want to make it difficult for Gentiles to turn to God. We, we don't want to make it difficult. It's what our church is all about. We don't want to make it difficult for our neighbors and our friends and our family members and our community to turn to God. We, we don't want to make it difficult in the way we communicate. We don't want to make it difficult in the way we sing. We don't want to make it difficult in the way we do events for Gentiles to turn to God, for, for our community to turn to God. He also was this phenomenal thinker. If you look at the, the book of James, it has lessons that he learned from his own Lord or his own big brother as he watched and listened to him. You can tell James just followed Jesus Christ around. But his biggest attribute, and when you read this book, it's phenomenal when it comes to doing. James didn't suggest. He commanded, okay? <laughs> Every, there are 50 imperatives in the book of James. That's amazing. There's like 10 per chapter telling us to do something. We're so postmodern, we like to think. We don't go observe, interpret, apply. We go, hey, here's my application. I need to find a Bible verse for it. It may or may not be true. And I think, and will I think? And you have a fight of, well, I think of what the Bible has to say. Unbeknownst to us, we've never really read first, interpreted second, applied third. We go the opposite direction. James just said, this is what God has to say. This is what we should do. And then his final character trait, more than anything, is he got on his knees and prayed all the time. In fact, his nickname in the church history is his, is his nickname was Camel Knees, that he got on his knees and prayed so much that there were just calluses on his knees from praying and talking to his big brother that was in heaven and asking for the power of God to be upon him. Power. Uh, Jesus' brother wrote the book of James. But the next question when you're doing Bible study methods is just simply not only asking who wrote the book, but to whom was it written? The audience is just as important to understand why this book was written and really understand themes that can impact your own life. And this is really phenomenal because James wrote to um, Jewish believers. Uh, it says so in, in chapter one, it says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 
tribes scattered. And this word scattered, hold that, uh, that word to you. We're going to just study that for a second, but it's, it's key for this morning's message. It is scattered throughout the nations. Greetings. James is writing to Jewish Christians throughout the nations. They're called the diaspora. That's actually a uh, transliteration or it's an English word we don't use much. We use the word dispersion for that, but it's an agricultural word. It means scattering seeds, or in this case with Israel, in the life of the church, in the Old Testament to the New, Israel was constantly scattered somewhere else. And here's the irony of this word. God desires scattering in our lives. And it starts with Adam, and then it goes to Noah. When it was just Adam and Eve, God says, look, I want you to be fruitful and multiply, okay? <laughs> think, what, think of that. Not the bad assignment for a guy, you know? You got the whole world, and you need to kind of multiply it, all right? All right, you guys didn't get that at all, all right. <laughs> and then the rain comes and destroys everything, and there's Noah and his three sons and a group, and, and they get the same assignment. Is God good or what, they're saying, right? <laughs> didn't get that one either. I tried it a second time. <laughs> Israel was asked, Abram was asked, he says, look, you're going to be the father of many nations, and this nation will bless other nations. Your whole purpose, Israel, is to bless. In fact, Israel was finally called the kingdom of priests, okay, kind of a weird title, but Israel was to be a pastor to all other nations to point them to Yahweh God, who desires to have a relationship with you, who desires to know you, and this was the calling of God, okay? And God desired this scattering to happen. This was your job, Israel, to go to other nations and not hoard it all to yourself or hoard God all to yourselves. And guess what, Christian? There's this verse called the Great Commission in Matthew 28 says, and it starts with this word, go. It starts with the concept of scattering. God wants us to scatter, go and make disciples of all nations. Not some, but all, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything, okay? So this scattering is not a bad thing. Uh, Christians are supposed to scatter. When God, Israel refused to represent God, it wasn't the scattering that was bad. It actually probably was the nation that forced Israel to scatter. That wasn't so hot. Like Babylonian, 586, they come to the southern part of Israel and they exile the, the people, meaning they took them all the way to what is the middle of modern-day Iraq today, Babylon. And for years, they stayed in Babylon. Daniel stayed in Babylon and Ezekiel, and they did their prophecy there. And Nehemiah, and there was the weeping prophet of, of uh, Jeremiah crying lamentations over this, this exiled kingdom. But the scattering ended up being a good thing, if you read those stories. And then Cyrus the Great, it's shown in the Bible where he's predicted to come. His literal name is in the Bible. Dead Sea Scrolls prove that he didn't know it until he read it. And so he comes and he reads this great prophecy and he releases the Jews to go wherever they want. And guess what they do? They scatter. Some come back to the homeland and others do not. By 1 AD, the largest city called Alexandria, 1 AD, when, basically when Jesus was born, they have 35 to 40% of Jews in this Egyptian city. Did you know that? So it makes a lot more sense. Not only a figure, a, spe a, figure, a type of, of Christ that Moses is when he leaves Egypt to save his people, but Jesus as an infant leaves Egypt eventually as a toddler to come save his own people. But not only that, there's just God placed a city for him to be protected by his own people as well. By 33 AD, when Jesus starts his ministry or in, and or finishes it, Jewish dispersion, diaspora, scattering is everywhere. And so when Acts 2 comes along, oftentimes it gets mispreached to me. Acts 2 is Peter talking to Jews. We just sang a song about the kingdom coming, right? The kingdom come. We want the kingdom of come. What does it mean to have the kingdom coming? It means the second coming of Christ, and we believe that the second coming of Christ is imminent, meaning it could happen any time. Guess when it could have happened? Acts chapter 2, when Jesus offers the Jewish leaders to repent and accept Jesus as their Messiah. He's in heaven. He comes down for a 
second time, a second coming, a second advent, and the end of the world's right there. Right there. It's fascinating where there's times in which if Israel responds, the end of the world, to a certain degree, is right there. Millennial kingdom gets ushered in, and the rest is history, or was history. And Peter in, in Pentecost acknowledges this gathering, but Peter's message isn't to the church yet. It's the somewhat the birth of the church, but it's also the last opportunity for Israel to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is a king. After the fact, after he was beat up, after he was crucified, after he died for three days, after he resurrects, after he's proven to be God, they have the captain obvious <laughs> conclusion that Jesus Christ is God. And they still are stubborn in their sin, like we can be. As, and he acknowledges this scattering. And Peter says, now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation. Uh, Pentecost means 50. It's 50 days after Easter. The Jews knew how to party. Can you imagine having another Easter 50 days after, you know, Easter? Let's not do eggs. Let's do milkshakes and hand them to kids. Or I don't know, you know, something else. But Jews just did this all the time. The, the first, the Passover, or what we would call uh, the Easter Sunday is... is where someone has to be sacrificed or a lamb gets sacrificed in the Jewish thing, a celebration that someday this death would be over. And it was. 50, years, 50 days later, it's called Pentecost, and it's a celebration of the, of the first grains, the first fruits that come out. And Jesus Christ is our first fruit. And he arrives, and either was going to arrive as king of kings and lord of lords over Israel, which would therefore evangelize the world, or through a seedling if they get rejected, to this mystery that Paul calls a church. And so Luke starts listing the spread, the diaspora. Remember, this is who James is writing this to. Parthians and Medes and Elamites. It's just these are regions. Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, and Phrygia, and Pamphylia. And I had those last two words I had to go pronounce it on the pronounced dictionary within. Okay, it's great. You got to Google it, okay? Basically, Turkey and Iran and Iraq and Saudi Arabia and Syria. There was this map and all of a sudden the diaspora is spreading. And Luke begins to do this without us knowing it, without it, unless we study the geography of this, that he's doing these concentric circles. Luke writing the book of Acts, and, he, and Luke continues, Egypt, the northern part of, Egypt, of all of Africa, Libya, uh, Rome even, Cretans and Arabs everywhere, and he just begins to draw this circle even wider, and all of a sudden this diaspora begins to spread. And more people were coming to this Jewish festival, and Peter gets together, and he, he says, and look at who he's preaching to, not the church, but to the Jews, fellow Jews, and all who live in Jerusalem, and he's addressing Israel, that the kingdom offer is still on the table. And it said, the Jewish leaders still reject the Son of Man, the Son of God, who died on the cross for the sins, rose again, and they knew it. Eight chapters later, Stephen is stoned as the first Christian martyred, and the Christian diaspora begins. And because of the persecution of Stephen, this great persecution happened against the church at Jerusalem. And everyone scattered, except the apostles. Scattering was a good thing. Scattering has this seed planting. Remember that? Remember I said to hold on to that? In verse four, check out what's happening. And those who had been scattered, what'd they do? Preach the word. Wherever they went, wherever they went, Christians were a scatter. And chapters 8 to 11 talk about how this gospel spread because Christians were scattering and preaching the word. And then in verse 19, it sums up this whole section. It says, now those who have been scattered by persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, and the map just continues to grow. This isn't a diaspora map or a scattering map. This is a gospel map. And look what happens with the scattering. The Lord's hand was with them. And how many? A great number, right? A people believed and turned to the Lord. Go and be scattered. 
to all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is our calling. Scattering's not bad. It is great. Why the history lesson? Because this is who the to whom is all about. That James is writing to not only to just a little region of Jews being persecuted, but to the whole Roman Empire. And he's giving a mandate of, to the believer on behalf of his big brother, Jesus Christ. And it's bigger than a book to encourage persecuted Christians. It's a scattering, which is our mandate. It's a gospel plan for you. And it's a gospel plan for me. And it's that critical that we understand what James is saying. When I first got here to Seattle, well, actually before that, what got me here to Seattle was I, uh, the year before I went to my best friend's wedding, and it was in Everett. My wife and I had a few days up here in Seattle. We were, my parents were, were based in Portland. We, we kind of flew there, but we got a, drove up here, and we went to uh, Pulsable and took the ferry back into Seattle. Have you done that? You got to. It's, it's a cheap date, guys. You got to do that. Buy, buy, your, buy your special one, the I don't know, popcorn, and, and, and uh, take a picture. And we did what was called not a selfie. I don't think it was a selfie. We must have had someone take our picture in a little camera. And here it was, Kid and Valerie in Seattle. And I was miserable in Texas. I don't know why people want to flock to Texas, but they do, you know. So <laughs> it's not worth being a Republican to go there. I'm just done. <laughs> oh, they'll have to take that one out. Someone's offended. Okay. <laughs> And we took a picture, and we just prayed. And I had that picture on my, de- my, my desk in, in uh, Dallas and Richardson and just prayed for Seattle. And God eventually called us to Seattle, and we helped start a church in Burien, Washington with, uh, as I, you've met, Harry, many of you have, my blind friend who taught me how to see, taught me vision, helped clean my heart out, bitterness and angry and all, anger and all that. And he taught me vision, and we planted a church out here. He scattered us on the east side of Seattle, southeast side. James is the who, and we are the to whom. And finally comes the why. Why did James write the book of James? And here was his concern. They scattered, and they scattered the the seed, but just like most of us, we have those moments we have those spiritual moments. We have those what we would call mountaintop moments. We have those where we would show and tell and bring whatever that is that represents that moment. But then we go back to the portfolio and then we go back to the job and then we go back to the raises. And those are all important. In fact, they're part of the scattering. But we forget the whole purpose of the scattering and what the purpose is of the job. The purpose is for the money. And we just spend it on ourselves and we just you know try to get to the next ladder of whatever our job is. And we forget that our job is to scatter to all the nations, wherever we're at. And so the problem was the church was failing to live what they professed to believe, and they just forgot. They forgot their scattering purpose. Y'all, there's a reason why we exist, and there's a reason why you move, and it's not for political reasons or comfort reasons or job or retirement reasons. It's for purpose. And there are two sides of being a Christian. There are two sides of being a Christ follower. One is your way to God, and the other is your walk with God. One is what is called your justification. It's Paul's term, which means one person coined it, just as if I never sinned. That when you come and trust in Christ, you believe you have this adoption into God's family. There's nothing you did but just simply understand who he is and what he's done. And and Paul states this theology because he knows we're going to mess it up years from now, okay? And in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he goes, here's the justification. And then Paul goes, let me address the sanctification part as well. Here's your way to God. And then chapter, verse 10, he goes, let me talk about your walk with God. Here's the way to God. For by grace are you saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It's a gift of God. It was none of your doing. It's not... The gift of God, it's not as a result of works. Let me just say it one more time. So no one will boast. It's absolutely free. But our sanctification, it's absolutely free too. Meaning you have the freedom to do it, asterisks, or not. You have the freedom to gain your money and use it for the kingdom of God because you're scattered. Or you can just hoard it and save it till the day you die and regret it when you feed Jesus. 
You have an opportunity to say something at work or not. You have an opportunity. You have these opportunities, Christian, but you don't have to. And sometimes we try to attack this don't have to to whether you're saved or not. You know, you got to, you know, persevere so many times or you have to, or you're losing, whatever it is. It's not true. Paul says the word should not will in verse 10. For we are his workmanship. What's workmanship? What's created? How? Created for purpose. We are his workmanship and we're created for purpose in Jesus Christ for good works. Didn't you say it wasn't good works? Don't get me to heaven. Absolutely, Paul says. But you have a choice, Christian, here on earth to scatter as God prepared beforehand that we out loud should, not will, no guarantee, walk in them. You have kids that make your bed and you have kids who don't. The kids who make the bed get rewarded, and the kids who don't make the bed don't. But they're still in your family. There's 27 books in the New Testament, and only one focuses on how you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. John wrote the other four, his other four books to Christians, but this one book, the Gospel of John, he wrote for seekers. And at the end, he goes, let me tell you my purpose if it wasn't clear in the first place, as I conclude this, let me tell you why I wrote the first 19 chapters of this book. Jesus did many other miracles. Ma'am, I wouldn't have time to write them all, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, so that purpose, so that purpose, you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by what? Out loud? That's the only condition, folks. You may have life in his name. All the other 26 books are for believers on the should. And that was James' concern. So why did James write the book of James? Because believers were living their life out on one book only. And they forgot about the heater. And they forgot about the Bible. And they forgot about the mountaintop experience. And they know they're saved. And is that okay? Yeah, sure. But God rewards. 26 other things that God has to say. 50 mandates, 50 commands that James is going to tell us about and how we can be on fire again, how we can sit down and go by that heater and open up the word of God and hear what it has to say. Christians were catering to the rich and they were competing for power and they were creating division and they were countering God's word and they were collecting material. Doesn't this sound like today? But working faith isn't that, is it? Working faith is simply real faith that produces these authentic results in our lives. Wouldn't it be neat by the end of this series that we had a different icon, a different image, a different spot, a different place, a different season, that God did something special in our lives because we just simply yielded to the word of God. Can you imagine if we just spent some time reading the book of James in one sitting this week and picked out something that's just exciting you, but then as you get chapter by chapter, you began to hear what God had to say. Can you imagine what your life would be like in two, three months when we're done with this book, what God has in store for you? This week, read James in one setting. Um, Sit down and take some time, 20, 25 minutes, minutes, just kind of speed through that. And then there's so many pithy little things. It's so cool. Just grab one and pull it out, put it in your heart this week. And we'll talk about James chapter one next week. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. And we'd be remiss not to tell you thank you for the word of God. Thank you for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Thank you for the book of Acts. It tells us how the church got started. Thank you for that mystery that was explained in the doctrinal statements of Paul, the great book of Romans and Ephesians that talk about the church and 1 Corinthians that talk about problems and 2 Corinthians that talk about just the relationships and why we have pain. Thank you for the book of James, that your little brother uh, wanted to do something, Jesus, really special, and he wanted us to do revival in our hearts. And so we just dedicate this series to you that you would revive us. And I'd be remiss, my friends online or in the gathering place or here in the barn, just to talk about Jesus for you in a personal way. And maybe you're seeking after God and you've never made a decision for Jesus. So follow my prayer here. It's just simply talking to God. It's what prayer means. And just tell the Father this, dear God, I know I sin. I know I mess up and I've done it every day and I can't stop and I need a savior. 
And today I understand that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for my sins, that Jesus rose again because he was God and had the power over death with no sting. And I believe that uh, he rose again and walked this earth for me so that I might live. And so my friend, just tell Jesus, just tell the Father in heaven, I believe. Just tell him that you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. Just tell him one more time in your heart, I believe. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Tis the season for scattering, so go out and scatter some grass and mow and golf and tell someone about Jesus this week. See you next week. God bless you guys. (laughs)